Imagine not taking all nighters. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not saying you're going to be able to eliminate every all nighter. I mean, come on, but I'm just saying fewer. Fewer all nighters with proper testing and debugging. I got to introduce the debugger in 116 today, which is always exciting. Um, running the debugger can cut down your debugging time significantly. If you haven't learned that yet in 442, get on that right now or after lecture, I'll say. After lecture, yeah, Google debugger programming or whatever. Get on that. I just use print statements. I mean, it's fine, but don't complain to me if you're spending 10 hours to find a two-hour bug. Is there a repo for the slides where we can pull them all at once? No. It, I'll post them. Um, Dr. Hertz usually posts them after lecture, so I'm a few hours before that. I'll post them before lecture because I download them from the website. Um, but no, I'm not going to post them early. Uh, and the main reason for that is I, I'll go through each slide deck and modify them as I need to before the lecture. So I don't want to post slides that I'm not going to present. Uh I know there's an announcement. Maybe there's not. Oh, yeah. If So any of you, uh, uh, a lot of teams already contacted me, but if you're planning to use the CSE servers, um, please send me a message on Slack. Have someone from your team send me a message. I'd like to get them all in. I should have put a deadline on this, but I want to get all the requests in. I got the first batch in. They responded, but I, uh, I got to do some organization with that before I can contact the teams. But anyone else who's any other teams who are planning to use that, make sure you let me know so I can get all these requests done. I don't want to keep bugging IT. Oh, here's another team. Oh, here's another team. If you can all get them in right now, I would greatly appreciate it. That was my announcement. I was forgetting. So let's talk about some more testing. <clears throat> so testing, the point of this is not to prove that there are no bugs. This is what I left you with last time. You can never prove that there are no bugs unless you're writing... Um, proofs like 331 style proofs to prove that you're correct on all inputs you with testing you're trying to identify the presence of a bug not the absence of any bugs so you write tests for specific bugs and specific inputs and if those tests pass you can be confident that your code is correct only on those inputs you might still have a bug in there that you don't have a test for and still have your test pass but you're at least confident that those bugs that you tested for are not present in your code. So that's our goal for um, goal for testing, is just to identify the bugs that we code to say, hey, do I have any of these bugs? And then it can say yes or no. Uh, the stream has not started. So in between, so like right at three, or right before three, I do cut the stream. I stop streaming for just a brief moment, and then I start streaming again, just so it organizes the VODs a little better. So you might open Twitch right at that moment when I was restarting the stream. Uh, but I do sh cut the stream in between 116 and 442. So it's possible you just got caught up in that. So let's dive a little deeper into this and talk about some some kind of debugging. Not debugging. Uh, I'm thinking debugger now. But some testing tips and tricks. And one thing to keep in mind, the 80-20 rule, this applies... The more I, you know, just the more things I do in life, this applies so often in so many different areas. The 80-20 rule they talk about in, in business, they talk about in programming, pretty much any uh, area you go into, there's going to be some version of this creeping up. Today, it's going to be 20% of the code is going to create 80% of the bugs. So when you're writing your tests, it's helpful to try to think of where that 20% is and write a lot of tests for that 20% of your code, and maybe not so much for the other 80%. You still want testing, and in this course, you're required to do testing there. Um, but knowing where you really need to dive deep and do some really thorough testing, and where you can just write some surface-level tests and uh, and be confident that it's fine is important. So these this 20% of the code is typically these cases where the modules are complex. Think... If you took in 331 or anywhere you have a complex algorithm where you have a lot of moving pieces, a lot going on to do your computation, it's going to be a lot of bugs there just naturally. Uh, those are perfect for unit tests, just some complex method that input output behavior is just not very clearly, uh, maybe clearly defined, but very, uh, very convoluted, very tricky stuff. You're going to want a lot of tests there. 
uh, where you can't easily just follow through the code. Uh, anywhere where the data might be different, where you expect uh, a method to take all kinds of different data inputs in it, uh, in that, you want to test that thoroughly, making sure you can throw all kinds of different data at it and have it still work. Any code that's frequently changing, code that you're always updating, you're always adding more features, etc. And any place where you need user input, this is, uh, I would argue, maybe the biggest, I don't know, it's hard to compare, but this is critically uh, important. The user can give you anything. If you're asking the user for input, you have no idea what they're going to give you. You got to be ready for anything in that case. So if you focus your testing on this 20% of code, it can help you uh, really um, improve your your coding, uh, your testing game. Uh, yeah, you can just improve your testing game. I thought I had another thought. Not quite. And you're always checking for those worst case situations. Again, I know I've mentioned 331 quite a bit here, but in algorithms, you're always looking at worst case, or I, I guess 252. With big O notation, you're always looking at the worst case. Same, similar theory applies here, where you're looking at what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst thing anybody can throw at my code? I need to test for that. And we want to test even very unlikely things. So common meme, QA engineer walks into a bar, orders a whole bunch of stuff. And then, of course, the program crashes anyway because the first customer, the first real customer who walks into the bar asks where the bathroom is. QA engineer didn't think of that. Program crashes. Done. Uh, so we want to focus on, uh, on not just the edge cases. This is somebody testing every edge case. But one thing that the QA engineer didn't test was something like ordering two beers, ordering a pitcher of beer. Uh, there are some common actual use cases there that weren't tested. So make sure you're also testing on just regular, just regular old inputs. What if somebody orders three beers? What if somebody orders a pitcher of beer? Uh, in that example, make sure you actually give it the expected inputs and make sure you have the expected behaviors. Don't get too caught up on checking only edge cases. And there are a lot of play things that you don't have to check. Uh, it's easy to get wrapped up if you get caught up in testing. It's easy to just start testing everything. There are certain things that you don't have to test. If there's an impossible input, don't test it. Don't write tests for these imaginary um, inputs that you're never going to see in the real world. Uh, and hopefully have some input validation on um, somewhere else in your code that's going to make sure that you're not getting those tests that are going to be completely broken. So... Is that? Oh my goodness! I'm a Twitch emote. Oh, I'm so happy. Like you, it's not easy to get a, a Twitch emote. Oh. Like you can't just upload it like a in Discord or Slack. Awesome. Slinks with the emote on his channel. Nice. What do I? Never mind. Um, all right, so sorry that was an, that was exciting. Uh, so here's a good test. If I have some uh, some stock representing the price of a stock on, in the stock market, and a method that should reduce that price by some value, a good input is testing zero. Is this going to? Um, if I give a reduced cost of zero, is the price going to be the same? after I call that. And remember, these are doubles. So we're always going to allow some tolerance to take care of the uh, of the truncation errors that we can get when we're working with floating point values and doubles in programming. So that's a good test case. Here's a good test case. Make sure that if the stock is reduced where it would be below zero, make sure you don't allow any negative, uh, negative prices. A negative price doesn't make sense. So if the price is 710 and I reduce it by 8, that should be 0, not negative 0.9. So this is another good test case, making sure that you have the, the behavior that you expect that's defined in your documentation, making sure that you have that behavior that the rest of your team expect, expects. If, the problem is if I apply for affiliate, I they'll run ads on the channel, and I don't want ads on the channel. It just doesn't seem right. 
a bad test case, assuming that you have some input validation that you're not ever going to call reduced cost of negative 100, um, this doesn't make sense. Your reduced cost, your documentation is going to define that it has to, uh, has to take a positive value. Maybe you can define what the expected behavior is in this case and then make sure that you have that undefined behavior. Maybe this doesn't adjust the cost, or maybe you even want to allow this and have that work as an increased cost method. Uh, but whatever your documentation says, uh, if, if this isn't a valid input, you shouldn't be testing for that if this method is never going to be called on that. If you are worried that somehow the way your code is structured, maybe you are taking user input as the input of this method, then yeah, you got to test negative 100. But really, you should have some input validation to make sure that this method just isn't called with negative numbers. So that's something you don't have to test if that's never going to happen. If that's an impossible case, maybe this... Um, if that's an impossible situation, don't bother testing it. So we're testing unlikely situations. We're always going to assume the worst. But we don't have to go so far as to test impossible inputs. We don't have to check something that's never going to happen. That's a bad test case, um, strictly just because it wasted your time. You don't want to waste time. Uh, so let's talk about something specific, uh, how to test loops. We talked about conditionals and branching last time, just some kind of rules of thumb for that. Let's talk about loops as well. Loops are very important to test because any small error in a loop is going to compound. Every iteration, that bug, that error, is likely to increase depending on what that loop is doing. So we want to make sure our loops are definitely bug-free. Everything should be bug-free, but loops especially can cause some really disastrous errors. Even if you have a double truncation error inside a loop, maybe your doubles are just getting truncated each iteration. If you're looping enough times, those truncation errors can add up especially if you're multiplying or dividing things, those truncation errors can hit you pretty hard. So making sure that you don't have bugs like that in your loops and that you can handle that and get the right expected results is pretty important. So very important to debug your loops very well. So let's talk about different types of loops. Start with simple loops. This is just a loop, a loop in your code. You all know what loops are. For a simple loop, just general rules of thumb. You don't have to stop at these. And you um, Sometimes you won't need all these, um, but at least a good starting place for testing loops is making one pass, write an input that makes one pass through your loop, two passes, and some input greater than two. And if your loop executes at most n times, if there's some upper limit to the number of times this loop can execute, make sure you test inputs like n and n minus one as well. Make sure you get those endpoints of your the range of your loop um, and uh, this will depend on your specific application what that loop is doing maybe there are certain cases maybe uh, n over 2 is a very important input maybe odd numbers are very important inputs whatever is the case for your particular loop make sure you're thinking about what it's supposed to do and what can go wrong and one thing that I see in all the time in 116 something that's easy to miss Make sure you check what happens when your loop is skipped entirely. So if your loop is iterating over a data structure, what happens when it gets an empty data structure? I see this in 116 when students um, they want to put a return statement inside a loop. And what, like if the loop is checking for a certain value and once it finds it, it's going to return it. If you just write a, a basic find method, it's going to return it. Well, if your return is inside your loop, what happens when I give that an empty data structure and you're never hitting the return statement? What's your method or function going to return? What's going to happen? Um, sometimes students like to put, or developers, I'll say just broadly, uh, developers like to put some initialization code inside their loop. If you're doing something like that and the loop is skipped entirely, that code was never executed. Or maybe some bookkeeping. Hey, this loop was called, this loop was called inside the loop. All that skipped. So make sure you're always testing what happens when the loop is skipped. Always uh, use those empty lists as inputs. What happens when n is zero? Um, all those cases where where code isn't being executed at all when you expect it to be might be expecting it to be executed.
very important to test. Uh, I always want to test what happens when my loop is not executed at all. A lot of programs break. That test can, uh, can find a lot of stuff. He just told you to do exactly that to, with the try catch block with a loop. Oh, try. And then if the data structure is empty, it catches it and throws the error. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm Anyway, um, next is nested loops. So this gets a little trickier. You have a lot of different combinations. And I'll be honest, I stared at this slide for a while. I, I'm just going to give my, my general uh, advice on this one. Uh, I stared at this for a while. I'm pretty sure there's a typo here, but it, just in case there isn't and somebody can make more sense of it, I, I left it as is. But for this, with each loop, you want to test the combinations of how many times each loop is running. So first start with the outer loop, executing exactly once, and then treat the inner loop like a uh, somewhat like a, uh, a simple loop is just a loop. Just test that and then start varying your outer loop. Have your outer loop run some max number of times. Uh, one time, two times, zero times, have your inner loop run zero times, all the combinations that make sense for your specific application. This one's tough to give general advice because if you're using nested loops, you probably have a very specific reason why you're using nested loops. So make sure you're testing what makes sense for your situation. Make sure you're hitting all those weird cases that can happen for that nested loop. I thought I deleted all those intermediate slides, but concatenated loops. If uh, So if you have one loop and then after that, another loop, if these loops are completely independent, cool, testing is easy. Just test each of them as though they were simple loops. If they are dependent on each other, the first loop computes some value that's used by the second loop or changes some state that affects the second loop. Um, now we got more testing to do and luckily we can just treat those as nested loops. Same things apply. Make sure you're you're testing all the combinations that make sense of these two loops. And finally, unstructured loops. If you ever see one of these, just delete that code. Run away from it, destroy it, burn it. Take any people who are involved in writing that and get rid of them. They don't deserve, they should not be programming. And if there's any documentation, throw it away. Start from scratch and rewrite new documentation with proper code. Don't have these unstructured loops that jump in between loops. This is something you can get when you use go-tos. It's one of the reasons we say go-tos are so evil. If you just jump around like this, run away, burn it to the ground, get it out of your life, whatever you do, whatever you do, need to do to get rid of those loops. I have uh, I have yet to, I don't think I've even come across an unstructured loop in my career. People are competent enough these days that hopefully they don't write one. I think it'd be tough to even write one in most languages. Maybe not. I guess I haven't tried, but just stay away from those things. <laughs> That's nasty stuff. So uh, unit tests are great and all. That's what we've been talking about. Uh, it's great for backend, making sure the backend functionality is well tested and running, um, running properly. But what happens when we get to the front end? And uh, in the client, this has nothing to do with your acceptance tests for your uh, stories. The client's not going to care about any of those unit tests that you wrote. It's not testing any of that functionality. So how do we write functionality tests for the front end that your user is going to care about? Our back end's tested, everything's good, but none of that matters if the user can't see it. If I don't have that on the GUI, nothing is going to be, um, nothing is going to be working. The FBI is watching us, oh no. Uh, so how do we simulate these, um, unit test suites, unit testing libraries and frameworks? They're just not going to cut it here. They're not going to help us out really at all for front end testing. So what do we do? Well, the worst case and probably the most common, if I were to guess, is just click around and see what breaks. Just fire up your GUI and click around. This of course, isn't going to fly in this, uh, in 442. Your project manager is going to expect actual testing being done, uh, being done for each of your tasks. If you have a front end development task and you said, oh yeah, I tested it. Look, I ran the GUI, I clicked around and it seems to work. Uh, you're going to get points off for the testing of that sprint. A better approach and 
check with your, I think I have an image here, check with your project manager if they're going to allow this. They're, for specific tasks, maybe, you know, this is what makes sense or, or, or whatnot. Um, but the next better approach is having a test by te um, sorry, te step by step script. So you write a script similar to an acceptance test, but you have much more detail. Enter this exact value in this um, box, hit enter, hit click this button or whatever. You should expect this to be the exact output and really specify exactly how to test this um, and have it very, very detailed. This is what you should do. This is what you should see. Whereas acceptance tests are a little more vague. Okay, use this and, and you know make sure it works the way you, it, it needs to be. I'd even argue that acceptance tests should be detailed like this. Um, but uh, certainly these should be detailed. Type in exactly these characters in this sequence and then hit this exact button. Um, and then somebody can follow the script. Remember, these tests are for technical people. You can get technical here and have a technical person run through the script and verify that it is correct. Then you can add that script to your tests in ZenHub and have that be your testing. The best approach is going to be to use automated testing for your GUIs. For this, unit testing isn't going to work for us, but there are tools out there for depending on what you need to test. If you need to test Java GUIs, if you need to test um, Android GUIs, or if you need to test web GUIs with Selenium, which we'll see, uh, have a few slides about here. So Selenium, this is used for our web apps, where so we can build automated testing for our web apps. And it's going to run a script that simulates a user using your app. And then, and you can write these scripts in whatever language you, know, you like. They, there are plenty of libraries, Selenium libraries for your favorite languages. You write a script in that language, and that's going to play around with your GUI, hit click buttons, enter text and inputs, and then have a search which says this now this component of my web page, this HTML element should contain these values, and you can do checks like that. So you can simulate a and automate a test for a web GUI using this. And the other libraries are similar for Java desktop GUIs and in um, mobile GUIs, mobile apps. So you can use the languages, you can use those frameworks, but the, the probably the best, at least the easiest solution is to use Chrome and use the Selenium IDE to be able to create your scripts. So with this, you can actually do pretty much your click around and see what breaks approach but the IDE will record that script and automate that test for you. And then you tell it, you know, okay, this should be this value. And that will create your testing script. That'll create the code that's going to automate this situation that you created where you just clicked around on your app and recorded it. Uh, so this is the easiest way to do it. This is what I'd recommend uh, to do. Right, and this is what, a script is going to look like one of the few colorless slides um, in these uh, in these decks. Uh, this is what that looks like in Java. This is a sample of uh, Selenium code. I'm going to grab a website, find some elements by name, or we could find them by ID. However, we want to find them. Grab some elements, make sure uh, send it some input. So we're typing. We're going to Google, and we're typing a search query for Hawaiian print computer. Submitting that. Uh, that query, which is going to be like typing that and then hitting enter, uh, wait for the results, and then make sure that uh, the title of the page that you that's loaded after submitting starts with Hawaiian. So when you do a Google search, the title is going to be your search. So we're going to verify that that title is what it's supposed to be. And we should have some tests to actually test the results. We can add this, but of course, that's not going to fit on the screen on the one slide, so I'm sure that's why that's omitted. But we could do any testing that we want, grab elements, check their values, and have our asserts in those um, in our script, in our Selenium script. Here's something similar in Python. 
same idea but different syntax. We're going to get uh, Dr. Hertz's faculty site. We're going to make sure that the title of the page has Matthew Hertz, is exactly Matthew Hertz, and then check some other a, um, properties of this uh, uh, of this page, of this page, and making sure that the proper elements are there. Of course, we could do a lot more testing than this. Right now, he's just making sure that uh, he has CSC 442 on there. But we can do all kinds of testing through these scripts, so we can automate GUI testing. Uh, for front end, there are a few kind of gotchas or things to look for. What does cert result do? I think this is just checking if that result existed. So it's looking for excuse me, CC 442. I think it's clicking every, I was looking at this, I, I believe it's clicking every link and then making sure at least one of those links resulted to a page that has CSE 442 in its title. Uh, result is going to be a Boolean, so a cert is just checking to make sure result was true. Uh, some things to check in front end GUIs. Make it sure you have some inputs that go over the bounds. This is back when I believe this is 140 characters, right? Or is this, I think this is before Twitter expanded to 240. Uh, it looks like 140, right? Is that what it used to be? Um, make sure you're inputting things that shouldn't be inputted. What, go, what happens when the input goes over what we expect? If this is submitted, we would expect the server to be able to kick that back and not actually take that as a valid tweet. Resizing elements, what happens when your panels and your divs are larger than the page? Uh, what happens when things are resized in certain ways? Actually, I think that's the next one. Maybe not. What that happens when your page is resized in certain ways? Make sure all your elements are still contained within that viewing window. And users are jerks or dumb or uh, outright malicious or they're attackers. Make sure you check every possible input that your users can send you. Everything that they can possibly access, everything that they can do, should be tested. And some of this is more server-side testing. If your user is editing your HTML and, for example, this tweet, if they uh, add these extra characters and then go into the HTML, activate the tweet button, and then click that button, or if they just treat this as an API and hit the endpoint directly with something that's an invalid tweet, the back end should catch that and say, hey, this isn't a valid tweet. I'm not adding it to the database. You know, try again. You should have those tests for um, absolutely for sure. Don't trust your front end. Never trust a web front end because your users can edit all of the JavaScript, HTML, CSS. They can make any change they want to that code. So make sure you're validating that stuff on the server side. Not entirely what we're talking about right here, but make sure you're validating that on the server side. You would have to see those tests. If your server takes user input, you know, check the hell out of that input because that, that could be literally anything. That's where you need to check negative numbers, you know, strings, all the crazy stuff because they can send anything to you. So they'll always figure out how to send you some crap. Make sure you have testing to see what happens when that uh, those really silly inputs get in there. Um, another thing, duplicate uh, inputs. If you say you're at you're on an online store, you're on Amazon, and you click purchase, you got your cart full, and you click complete order, and it takes like half a second to load, and you get impatient and you click it again. Should Amazon process that order twice and send you double the stuff that you just ordered? Or should it only send you one of those? Most cases, for most applications, you only want that input to be taken once. So checking for repeat submissions um, is something that you really should be checking for. If uh, if you even if you just have a chat app, if somebody sends the same exact chat twice back to back, maybe this is a feature. Maybe you want to allow that, but in most cases, that's um, something that the user doesn't want. They don't want the exact same message. So you gotta at least test for it and make sure whatever your team agrees should happen is what's happening. And finally, checking the back button. Does the back button break your app? Have tests for that. Test if the back button breaks your app. If it does, you got some debugging to do. Um, 
but users are going to use the back button. They're not going if even if you build some beautiful navigation for them and you have your own buttons on site, users are going to hit the back button. You've probably done it as a user too. I know I do it too. They're going to use the back button because it that's why it exists. Give me take me back one. Make sure that doesn't break your app. And look for all those um, crazy cases. Make sure you're checking leap years. Make sure you're te- checking inputs that shouldn't ever exist that don't really um, that don't mean anything for your application. Check all those edge cases just like we do in unit testing. Make sure you're testing everything that people can put in. Uh, February 29th on a non-leap year, that's a good one to check. And uh, your app should be viewable on any screen size, I guess within somewhat a reason, reason. So testing how it displays on, say, a mobile phone in portrait, a mobile phone in landscape, a, um, a window that doesn't take up your entire screen, uh, any crazy kinds of resizes. How does it show up on very large screens? Your app should look good in all of those, or at the very least be usable in all of those. It shouldn't start hiding elements and give you less functionality because they're rendered off the screen. Uh, so have, testing for all of those would be uh, would be good. Do I recommend using alerts as a way to debug some functionality? I mean, if that's how you want to do it, I don't, personally, I don't like alerts, but if that's what's working for you, um, why not? Especially for debugging. If the users aren't going to see the alerts and you like the alerts for debugging purposes, go for it. Yeah, have the alert come up and give you all kinds of information. Uh, what I prefer is just doing console.log and then open up the console in my browser when I'm debugging and have all kinds of information sitting there for me. And your browser has a debugger built into it. Every browser has a JavaScript debugger. So you can actually run the debugger also on your web page. Um, I prefer those over alerts, but um, but whatever works for your workflow. Uh, I left these slides in there because I think they're funny. JavaScript is a horrible, horrible language. I do agree. Uh, but... Uh, it's, it's just awful. So what about non-UI JavaScript code? You have this code running in the browser. JavaScript code that's not uh, not necessarily affecting the UI, but that has some of your functionality in it. How do we test this? Well, that's tricky. Uh, so some history on JavaScript. It was created in 10 days. Uh, it wasn't really meant to be a mainstay language like it is, but it runs in the browser. We like browsers, and it just blew up in popularity. And uh, specifically, before someone calls me out on it, so this is specifically ECMA script, um, which JavaScript is an implementation of. But the spec ECMA script is, uh, which has been adapted for the browser, it's just not great. Um, and the name doesn't have anything to do with Java. They Oracle was, you know, they wanted Java and JavaScript to be like partner languages or so like javascript was going to be the scripting version of java uh, at least for a marketing perspective but the languages don't have anything to do with each other uh and uh i forgot the the analogy oh uh java is to javascript as car is the carpet is the best way to put it it's just completely different things they just happen to both start with java uh but the so with JavaScript's design being thrown together quite a bit, one of the big design features of it is that you can do pretty much anything with the language. The language doesn't get in your way, which can feel pretty liberating when using the language. But it also means you're going to have messes of jumbled code. It's OO functional and declarative all in one language, and uh, and it's very easy to mix these paradigms as you're coding. And one program can have all three of these in random places with seemingly no structure. And that's what a lot of JavaScript code ends up being. If you have a functional, someone who loves functional programming on your team and somebody who loves OO, you're gonna get both in your JavaScript code. And it just kind of makes a mess. Um, But the real difficulty here is testing. There's no real good testing framework. Mocha is the best one. And you know, that seems to be the most popular as well. Um, And it's, you know, it's good, it works. Uh, but really it's 
pretty tough to test the JavaScript code, but there are options for you. Uh, Mocha tests your front end JavaScript functionality, um, but just be aware that your JavaScript is uh, can be a bit tougher to test. Uh, one alternative you can use for this is use a language that compiles to JavaScript. Uh, there are several, uh, there are many of them out there available. So you can write in your favorite language. TypeScript is gaining a lot more popularity and then compile it into JavaScript. So you're never working with JavaScript directly. You're working with a separate language and then compiling it into JavaScript. Uh, and uh, when testing your code, things to look out for. Make sure your code does what it's supposed to do and it can be used for that purpose. Make sure your code is reliable. Make sure it's uh, it's going to always be doing what it's supposed to be doing. It should be robust. No matter what how it's used, it shouldn't break. So any uh, so reliability. If it's getting valid inputs, you know, 50 times a second or more for years, it should keep working. Robustness. If it's getting all kinds of crazy inputs and edge cases, it's got to work still. You can't have your servers crash. Um, and it should be fast, you know, decently fast, especially if it's a web app. If your code takes a full second to run and a user's waiting a full second for that page to load plus network time, you know, a lot of people are going to leave. They're not going to wait a full second. And the whole point of these last two lectures, if you have weak tests, Expect to be looking for jobs. Testing is important. Once you get that first big bug released to production, released to the users, and you're the one to blame because you didn't do testing, ooh, man, good luck. And just a quick reminder, the difference between acceptance tests and test tests. Acceptance tests, you write with your user stories. These are non-technical. These are client-focused. And you've written these for your user stories, your um, your project manager has talked to you about them, helped you revise them, and worked on these user stories and acceptance tests. Task tests is after you break a story into separate technical tasks, you have task tests, which is what we've been talking about these last two lectures. These are your unit tests, your Selenium scripts, all your, um, your technical testing to verify that that technical task has been completed, not does this feature exist and can my users use it? But this is that small task that I had that's part of that story that's going to help complete that story. Um, when is that completed? And these should, whenever they can, they should be automated. But talk to your project manager, ask them what is and is not acceptable for your task tests. And whatever they say, they're the manager of your project, that's what goes. Start working on sprint one. Remember the tests. Every task needs tests. Even when it's a research task, ask your PM, what do you expect for the verification of this research task? Uh, usually they'll want detailed notes explaining what you've learned from that task test. I always like to see a demo. I want to see a demo of some sample program that you wrote with that knowledge that you've gained. 